watching on YouTube right now, you can see we have a puppy and a cat in front of you. We've got Dexter and Dobby joining us today for Pandemic yes. Provisions. Two sharp um, pets in the microphone. Two exactly, the microphone. exactly. So we are going to get really quickly to John Arena, the amazing, ridiculously Yoda cool pizza Olo coming up. But first we're going to talk Pandemic Provisions. And provisions are just about things that are getting you through this like complicated, rando, weird time of ours that we're having. And so instead of food today, we're talking about our pets. I've got Dexter here. Quick background on Dexter. He's a very stately and distinguished 12 years old. Ooh. He's a really good boy, except he doesn't want to be sitting here very much longer. But um, we got his name, or we made his name, Dexter, from the serial killer Dexter Morgan on one of my favorite shows of all time. Um, he's a serial killer with a heart. So um, always liked the show Dexter, and so he became Dexter Morgan Moss. How about you, Louie? This is little Dobby. Um, I adopted him about two or three years ago. He was probably about six or seven, I think, at the time. So I don't know which makes him like ten in human years, but I don't know how that, how old that translates to like cat years. <laughs> and he was really called Dobby, and I never changed his name because like, oh, yeah, Dobby. Dobby is the house elf from Harry Potter, the one that was wearing a little sack and stuff. Yes. Yes. And as you can see, he has somewhat of a resemblance to Dobby, like ears and face-wise, so. Yes, the ears and the skin, and he's a cute little naked cat. Yes. Yes, he <laughs> is. So quickly, we just want to say about pets, you know, it's not like in your, you know, in your mind and your heart only that they actually make you feel better. It's actually a lot of real scientific things. So what we've learned is, one, actually playing with your dog or your cat can raise the level of serotonin and dopamine in your brain, which makes you happy. And piggybacking off of that, that leaves you less depressed. There are like, they lower your blood pressure a lot. So it's like an overall like plethora of positive health effects to actually have like a, a feline yes. or like a canine friend. Yes. And speaking of friends and happy feelings, please listen right now because this may be our favorite podcast of all time coming up. We've got John Arena, super positive vibes. He's gonna just make you feel good and you're gonna feel inspired right after this podcast. So stay tuned right now. We're gonna have John Arena. Louie and everybody out there, you're really in for something today. Today we are with the OG of Pizzaiolos, Mr. John Arena, a.k.a. Johnny Pizza Guy from Metro Pizza. How are you, Johnny? I think pizza has always been ad adaptable and uh, has always been a source of comfort for people. So I'm doing fine. You know, I just look at it as, a, as an obligation to connect with people and bring them a little happiness in a crazy world. You're kind of a big deal. People know you. As you can see behind John Arena, if you're watching this on YouTube, he also has leather bound books and it smells of rich mahogany in his office over there. So he's a really big deal. Um, what do you think about the fact that you may be actually more famous outside of our city of Las Vegas than you are actually inside it? So people may know you even more because you're so big in like the pizza world. I, th I think that's probably true of a lot of people, you know, when you you know, your neighbors take you for granted, you know, and I think, um, you know, if you're the beautiful girl next door, the guy, your neighbor doesn't look at you, but then you, then you go away to college and everybody's all over you, you know, it's, it's just one of those things that familiarity, you know, kind of 
maybe dulls the, the luster a little bit, but that's okay. You know, I think it's important to not let that stuff go to your head. Yeah. Maybe that helps you then not realizing. You know, and, and, and really that kind of notoriety, you're as good as the next pizza that comes out of the oven and no better. That's true. Well that's said. Interesting thing about food, right? Very well yeah, said. You know? Okay. And, and that's, you know, that's also an opportunity because it's an opportunity and obligation to reprove yourself every time and to never let it get stale, never let it get old. Always, always let it be something that's fresh for you. You know, I hear so many times I'll, I'll hear young pizza guys say, oh, I've been doing this for five years and it's, it's, it's getting tired. I'm, I'm a businessman now. How does it get tired? <laughs> every time you pick up a dough ball, it's a fresh experience. It's a fresh opportunity to learn something about yourself and to express yourself and who you are at that moment. Tomorrow, I'm not gonna be the same pizza maker that I was today because we've had this discussion and this discussion will change me in some way. Wow, that's such a beautiful way to look at life. I love that. Uh, you've cooked for several US presidents. So in honor of the United States of America, let's start with Jimmy Carter. I don't wanna get into the politics of any of these people, but Jimmy Carter, you know, even when he came into the pizzeria, he was the most gracious person. He went around to every table and introduced himself. So people were eating their pizza and they looked up and all of a sudden the former president of the United States was standing over them with a big smile on his face and an extended hand, you know, saying, hi, I'm Jimmy Carter. I used to be the president of the United States. You know, so there was that humility and warmth that you don't get with a lot of politicians, you know, and, that, and you know, whether you agree with his policies or not when he was president, Look at how much he's done as a, as a human being. His Habitat for Humanity work has been extraordinary. His post-presidential presence has been, you know, just wonderful. Yeah, definitely like a calming force. How about Bush? George Bush, he always sent the Secret Service guys in. So we didn't get to meet, we didn't get to meet him. Um, the Secret Service guys would come in and pick up the pizza, watch the pizza being made and take it to, take it to the plane. Take it to Air Force One for the trip back. What's that like when the Secret Service is in the joint? Uh, it's a little unnerving, <laughs> you know, but that's okay. You know, every, you know, they want to make sure everything's perfect, and I understand that, but we want to make sure everything's perfect for everybody. You know, everybody's the president when they come in. You know, that's part of the hospitality. Yes. What about President Clinton? President Clinton. They used to call up a lot of, he, was, he used to stay at Brian Greenspan's house mm -hmm. and Brian Greenspan was a customer. So they used to call up for delivery. So, um, you know, we're, prou we're proud of almost all of the presidents that we've served. <laughs> How about Obama? Oh, awesome. Obama, um, same thing. Somebody would call up and pick up for him. Um, and then president, the current president, uh, we would deliver to his private plane before he was president. So I want to know, since you've been around for a long time, and I know that you've cooked for mobsters before, what's that like? Is that like any other guy? Or is that, is that really some added pressure and some like interesting feeling about like, I've got to get this pizza right and what's going to happen here? You know, you, you want every pizza to be right. You want every yes. pizza to be an expression of who you are. But the thing that was interesting about those guys was they used to come in and order pizza, and then they would send their crew back at night to burglarize my store. So how did you know it was them? I mean, how could, you, how could you tell? Because at that time, you know, everybody kind of knew everybody in Las Vegas. And yeah. there was a gang called the Hole in the Wall Gang, which was out of Chicago, Spalatro's crew. Uh -huh. so, Who, the guy you know, in Casino? The guy in Casino that was based right, on... Right, the guy that was portrayed in Casino by, by Joe, Pesci. Joe Pesci. Yeah. Right. So, um, you know, they lived in that neighborhood where our first store was. Mm -hmm. And we had, we had like arcade games in there. So there'd be a lot of money in the arcade games. Not a lot of money by, you know, it just shows you what gangsters are like. It's like they're robbing money from, from mega casinos and they're also taking the quarters out of our Miss Pac-Man gym. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, it's like not awesome, but it's like kind of mm -hmm. awesome, right? <laughs> yeah. How do, After how do you... a while, we used to not even, we wouldn't even call the police when we were, when they robbed us. We would just come in, sweep up the mess and go back to work. That's just, what? That's just so crazy. <laughs> I was just about to ask you that. Is like you just get used to it at some point. Like you're not gonna mess yeah, up too the much, sixth right? After the sixth or seventh time, you're kind of like, okay, they came to get their their their, their monthly withdrawal. 
Oh my god. Okay, I have a question. What What is a mobster's favorite pizza flavor? Cheese pizza. Really? Yeah, you know they tend to be they tend to be uh, traditional when it comes to when it comes to food, Italian yeah. food or Italian American food. Right. So you know, especially you know the older guys. I grew up in a time when you know my original family pizzeria. There were four toppings on the menu. Yeah. Mushroom, anchovy, sausage, and peppers. Mm-hmm. Mm. You know, that was it. You know, so cheese pizza is the basic, and cheese pizza is also it's the it's the benchmark of what your real skills are because you can't hide anywhere. Right. You know, I want to ask you about that a little bit too, because the best pizza I've ever had, just in my opinion, was in Italy, which is a lot of people's opinions. But I mean, when I was in Italy, it was transformative and it was cheese pizza. It was sauce pizza. It was, you know, maybe like a margarita at most. That was like the the most toppings that I'd seen a lot of Italy where I was traveling when I was traveling there like what do you think about that the idea of just like super simple pizza and maybe the idea that some have which is like maybe you shouldn't put a bunch of fancy things on pizza you know for me I, I think it's you know three three items at most and you're done you know but um but I can under, I appreciate that people want to express themselves in different ways and you know the pizza should be it should be collaborative. It's not just about what I like. You know, like you hear all these guys that say, I won't, I won't sell ranch dressing or I won't put pineapple on a pizza. Right. You know, and, and they get, and they, you know, they plant their flag, they plant their heels on that. But to me, the pizza is a collaboration. My favorite way of making a pizza is that, you know, you sit at the, you sit at the counter, the counter table and we talk and I get to know you and I get to learn something about you and what you like and what, you know, what your background is. And then we try to make your pizza dream come true using my skills and, and your experience and your preferences. And, you know, let's work together on this. Let's collaborate. Not only, not only is pizza communal food in, in terms of eating the food, but also in terms of sharing the experience with the pizza maker. Yeah, definitely. Uh, is there any kind of preference for you? Like, I know there's, you know, coal fired, wood fired, thick, thin, like, is there like a perfect pizza to you or is it all kind of the same to you? Or what is the John Arena pizza? Yeah. Like to me, what, you know, to me you? you know, the Sicilian pizza that we do at our store, the way that mm. that's evolved over time so good. is an expression of, of what we've learned and experienced traveling all over the world. So that's my go-to because, it, you know, it's, uh, it's not fast food. It takes six, six days to make it. Yeah. You know? But there's a lot of love there. And there's, and there's, just, there's reasons, there's justification for every, every step. You know, every step is important. So when you talk about coal-fired, wood-fired, electric ovens, gas ovens, this ingredient or that ingredient, it's a combination of everything and how they all work together and what you want your result to be. You know, I'm not, I'm not an equipment junkie. I'm not one of these guys that, you know, it's like Chris Bianco says, you put garbage in the oven, you get garbage out of the oven. You know, so people think they're going to buy a wood-burning oven and all of a sudden they're going to be a master pizzaiolo. It takes 25 years to learn the basics of your craft. You know, so people that tell me they're tired of making pizzas after five or 10 years, that it's getting boring, it never gets boring. The worst thing that can happen to me is somebody comes in and says, wow, it's amazing. I've been coming here for 40 years. Your pizza is exactly the same as it was 40 years ago. And I'm like, kill me now. I haven't <laughs> learned anything, you know, I haven't learned anything in the last 40 years. Yeah. I don't want my pizza to be the same as it was yesterday. Yeah. Because I'm not the same as I was yesterday. So you're you know, basically saying that, you know, it's, it's, it, I don't think it's like a consistency thing that you're trying to get at here. I think it's more of like a, a love and evolution for your final product. Absolutely. It's an evolution. And, you know, consistency in a business model makes sense, but it's also a form of culinary fascism. You know, it's like we have <laughs> to do late. it exactly. We have to do it exactly this way. You know, we ha it has to be the same every time. It has to be cookie cutter. It has to be yeah. uniform. I think it has to be the same in spirit. What's right. in your heart has to be the same. But the expression of that has to change as you change and as you evolve. You look at any great artist, they, they, went, they went through phases. They went through stages of development. This moment, this conversation that we're having right now, we can never have this again. It'll never be exactly the same. We'll hopefully get together again, but we won't be the same people. So shouldn't we be mindful of that? Shouldn't we be... Shouldn't we be respectful and honor this time that we're having together right now for how 
unique and fragile it is. You actually taught classes at UNLV in the history and culture of pizza. So since you are a professor, we would like to learn about something that you think would be interesting for us and for our audience that's just maybe people don't know about the history of pizza? The history of pizza goes back really 6,000 years. Wow, 6,000. You know, it's connected to the history of bread baking, Makes the history of, of controlling fermentation. Mm -hmm. But if you go back to the ancient Egyptians that were baking bread, that's really, that can be considered to be almost the start of the pizza making tradition. The Greeks, the Greeks invaded, invaded Egypt. They colonized Southern, they learned to bake bread from the Egyptians. They colonized Southern Italy. They brought those bread baking techniques with them. So you have the first component of pizza right there, the bread, brought to Italy by the Greeks. Okay, so what's the next thing that goes on a pizza? Sauce. What kind of sauce? Marinara. Tomato, tomato. sauce. Where does the tomato come from? Mm, Originally. Italy. Peru. Okay. Peru. Would not have guessed. Oh. South America. Okay. Okay, so the so so the area the area that is now Peru was uh, explored, colonized, conquered by the Spaniards. They brought the tomato back to Europe at that time. Spain, uh, Naples was part of the Spanish Empire, so they brought this. They brought the tomato to, to Naples. They grew those tomatoes on on the slopes of Mount Vesuvius. What goes on pizza next? Cheese. What kind of cheese? Mozzarella. Mozzarella. And originally, what was mozzarella made from? What kind of milk? Mm, goat. Sheep. Water buffalo. Whoa. Mozzarella di buffalo. Yeah, that makes okay. sense. That makes sense. Well, the water buffalo is not indigenous to Italy either. We have a cheese that comes from from an animal that comes from Southeast Asia, by virtue of warfare and religious conflict. You have a tomato that comes from South America. You have a bread that originally comes from Egypt, and you finish it with what herb? Basil. Basil. Basil comes from India by way of the spice traders. So there's the pizza margarita. Every component of the pizza margarita comes from somewhere else. It's like world wow. peace and food. So all of the things that shape, shape the world, all the things that shape society and civilization, religious conflict, exploration, warfare, commerce, um, exploration, all of those things are there on that, you know, the simple food, four ingredients, all of those factors are there on that plate. But how could you not respect it? How could you not respect the fact that this is an important food and that the story of civilization is there on the plate hmm. if you go in with an open mind and you're willing to read the story? Every pizza, you know, people to ask me, as you did, which pizza do I like best? I like pizzas that tell the story of the person that made them or tell the story of where they came from. Just look at it and say, there's a story here. What is this pizza trying to tell me? And you'll enjoy it so much more. And what happens with that is you become a, a responsible consumer. When you think about the food before you eat it, you're more gratified. You don't have to eat as much because the, the food is, is speaking to you and nourishing you in a different way. Yeah. So I, you know, I think that's really important. You know, I, I did a, uh, a demonstration once with a food historian from, from uh, Naples. And I was staying in the same B&B &B with him and I watched him make a cup of coffee in the morning. And it took him 15 minutes to take the beans and grind them by hand and measure them out and heat up the water to exactly the right temperature. And he poured this cup of coffee and when he poured it, he took it and he held it up to the light and he looked at it before he drank it and then he smelled it. And I, and I said to him, Mimo, it took you 15 minutes to make a cup of coffee. <laughs> if, you know, we would just put a Keurig cartridge in the machine and push the button and have coffee in 30 seconds. And he said, yes, that's because Americans eat like sharks. <laughs> and I, right. I, I said, what do you mean? And he said, they move forward with their mouths open and closing and swallowing, yeah. but they never think about where the food came from and who made it and what it took to get there. And the result is that your coffee has to be 24 ounces when ours is three ounces and we get the same amount of satisfaction out of it because we think about it and we take the time to understand the process. So if you take, you know, if you take a tomato and you think about that tomato and you think about what it took to get that tomato to your, to your table, the combination of sunlight and rain and soil and a nurturing farmer 
and, and pickers who came here from another country to work those fields. And then, a per, and then somebody to truck that, to pick that tomato at the exact right time and get it, to the, get it to your supplier. That tomato becomes much more than just a commodity. And you're not as inclined to waste it. So if we thought about our food in a responsible way, if we thought about what it took to get there, we wouldn't have all the waste. We wouldn't have all the, we wouldn't have all the misconsumption of food and there'd be plenty for everybody. You have that beautiful map inside Metro and it has pizza joints across the country on it. You also encourage people to go to those places and then if they go and they show you a receipt and a picture, you'll actually give them a gift card to Metro. So right. why, do you, why, do you take, why do you take those links to do that? Because it's about honoring our craft and supporting our, supporting our brothers and sisters in, the, in, in our industry and uh, learning something about a particular place and culture and time by experiencing the food. And pizza is such a, such a wonderful expression of the location that it's being made in. Hmm. You know, it tells you so much, if you, as we said, if you're willing to listen to the story. And I just think it's a wonderful way to, to promote the idea of colleagues, not competitors. One of the best pizza experiences I've ever had, and I'm a Brooklyn-born pizza maker, you know, a New York pizza maker whose worldview largely when I got to Las Vegas was everything revolves around New York. You know, but one of the best pizza experiences I've ever had was in a town called Sardis, Mississippi. Hmm. I guarantee you've never heard of Sardis, Mississippi because it's, you know, it's a I'm body not. shop, a bail never. bond, a blinking light, and a stray dog, and a pizzeria. <laughs> yeah. There's really nothing there except this amazing pizzeria. You know, so you can find, you know, there's people doing incredible things everywhere. There's people now making pizzas in their, in their home kitchens that are rivaling stuff that was done in pizzerias 25, 30 years ago. Yeah. A dedicated amateur pizza maker now that's cooking at home knows as much about the history and culture of pizza as the old time pizza, pizzaiolos did when I was coming up where, where nobody talked to each other, nobody shared information. You know, it was such a negative environment and that's really that's the thing that's changed that's really wonderful about pizza is that unlike any other part of the culinary world pizza makers share yeah you know louie and i talk a lot about it on the podcast and that's like really our whole point of the podcast is building community in the culinary family and what do you think, because we feel like it is more collaborative here in Las Vegas than it is in other cities. We've cooked in other cities, um, bigger cities where it's, you know, maybe more competitive than collaborative. And I feel like it's the other way here. We're always trying to look at ways to help each other, to grow each other, um, to teach each other. So what do you think about the Las Vegas culinary family? Besides the fact that the, the level of skill has increased tremendously, it's also changed in that it's very collaborative now. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, we're, we're kind of, you move here and you're kind of like a, you know, you, we're kind of like we're all immigrants together. It becomes more, more vital to collaborate, more vital to, to share. And once you get a taste of that, you never want to go back to the old way of doing things, that, that kind of guild, protective, closed society environment. You know, when, when I was growing up in pizza, in working in my family pizzeria, it was common that pizza, pizza, pizzeria owners took the knobs off their ovens so that their competitors couldn't see what temperature they were cooking at. <laughs> wow. That's competitive. You peeled the labels off of the tomato sauce cans and shredded them before you threw your trash out at night. Your name comes up constantly in our conversations. We talk with a lot of people over the last year and a half. We've talked to several different people from different cultures, different backgrounds, different kinds of food making, different chefs. Dan Cromer calls you Yoda, the Yoda of pizza. Uh, of course, your protege, one of your proteges, Chris Decker, he calls you a father. Uh, what do you want your legacy to be? Legacy is honoring everybody that took the time to love you and nurture you and teach you. So I hope that if I have a legacy, it'll be that all the people that I loved and cared about that maybe aren't around anymore, will have a sense, of, will have a, a sort of immortality because something that they taught me will be passed on to another generation. You know, that's the wonderful thing about pizza is it becomes almost like a time machine. It, you know, it keeps people alive, you know, everything that, everything that I value, everything that was taught to me by other people that cared about me, 
remains alive in me every time I touch a piece of dough. And if, you know, if I, sometimes out of the corner of my eye, I'll see, I'll see Chris do something, just a hand technique or something that he maybe, maybe I didn't teach him directly, maybe he just picked it up by osmosis or by standing next to me for 25 years. But I'll see something and I'll say to myself, that's my uncle Tony. What he just did came to, you know, so, excuse me. So my uncle Tony is still alive through Chris. And Chris is now handing that on to someone else. So that's what legacy is. Legacy is about honoring and keeping the memory alive of everyone that you valued and everyone who took the time to love you and nurture you. I feel like pizza is an al analogy for life for you. you. You relate it back to everything in your life, it feels like. Yeah, and you know, if you care about it, it's got to be like that. You know, it's got to be more than just uh, an Instagram post. It's got to be how, what, how you live, you know, a, a part of who you are. You know, it's like the way of the pizza maker, you know, um, which means that it shapes, it shapes your life and influences your life and influences everybody around you. And it's not just, I'm, I'm a pizza maker, I'm a pizzaiolo, not just when I'm making pizza, but when I'm doing everything. Because my perspective, my, my life has been shaped by the things, the lessons that I've learned from going to the pizzeria every day. Okay, we are moving on to show and tell with John Marina, owner of Metro Pizza, pizzaiolo extraordinaire. John, what are you showing us today? I'm gonna to show you a book that really changed the way I looked at pizza. It's out of print now, but this is a book called The Pizza Book. It was written by a lady named Evelyn Sloman about 40 years ago. <laughs> And she was an amazing pizza, she's an amazing pizzaiolo, but also a pizza historian. And it was the first book that was written that showcased the pizzaiolos. It was like almost like a history book of, Amer of the, the heritage of American pizza. And if you grew up in a pizza family, you always felt that a pizzeria was special and that your family was special. And you, you recognized that it was, that it was an important part of a, of a neighborhood or a community. But the rest of the world didn't necessarily look at it like that, you know. So people would say stuff to me like, when I was like, when I was in high school and college, like, "What are you gonna do, sling pizzas the rest of your life?" You know, and they didn't mean it in a good way. They meant it as an insult. Yeah. You know, as a, as a big, it's like there was something wrong with being with with aspiring to being a pizza maker. And Evelyn wrote this book that talked about the history of pizza makers, and and she talked about it was, she was the first person to talk about pizza makers. I wouldn't want to say as if they were celebrities, but as if they were important, important in their neighborhood and that, and that they, they left behind a heritage that was something to be honored. And, and I look, I read that book and I was like, wow, somebody outside of our culture, our subculture gets it. And this is the way I've always felt about it, but I didn't know how to express it. And she did. And it was just like, it was a game changer for me. And I keep a little note in here in this book to remind myself whenever I read it and I, I open it frequently, but I always keep this little note inside it, inside. I don't know if you can see this. Might not be able to read it. Sono un pizzaiolo and basta. Can you basta. Sono un pizzaiolo e basta. Okay. And it means I'm a pizza maker and that's enough. You know, if I had an oven out on the street corner somewhere, and Chris Decker and I stood side by side for the rest of my life and made pizzas together and made people happy, that would be enough. Yeah. And Louie and I would definitely be there. <laughs> oh, yeah. I want to learn. I want to go to pizza school. Yeah, no? yeah, 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 yeah. Right? You. I rarely get to be in the presence of a master. And, and I can totally feel and Hopefully it someday you'll get to do that. Right? <laughs> right? Of course he has to turn it on you, Lou. <laughs> right? I know, right? Moving on with the laughs, we're going to go to On the Fly. It's a yeah. rapid fire questions. This should be very interesting with our pizzaiolo. John Aha. Marina, Louie, you got your timer ready, sweetheart? I got my timer ready. Okay, go ahead. Let's go. I'm going to start. Go. Your all time go to pizza, John Arena. 
Spockanopoly in Chicago. If you could have a superpower, what would it be? Make people fall in love with what they do. Best cooking advice you were ever given? Take the time to do it right. Dream place to travel and eat? Always Naples. Mm. Childhood food craving? Pizza. <laughs> Most inspiring kitchen music? Wow, that's a tough one. Most inspiring piece of music, whatever makes my coworkers dance. <laughs> oh. Um, what haven't you done that you really want to do still? Make a pizza that I think defines what I am. How do you like your eggs? Over easy. Me too. Um, what did you want to be in kindergarten? When I want to be in kindergarten. Yeah. I wanted to work with my father. Oh. And I still get to do that every day. My dad's 92 years old. He goes to the pizzerias every day. Oh my gosh, I have to meet him. I can't believe I haven't met him yet. I've been there so many times. Right. Um, Dream dinner partner, living or dead? Oh, my wife. Aw. All right, one black, blackmailable fact about Mr. John Arena. When I was a kid, I had a really bad temper. Okay. And I learned to control it. What did you do, though? What did you do? Like, an example of, like, really bad behavior. I would I would like to fight a little bit. Mm -hmm. I can How see did you that. learn to control it? Um, I was lucky when I was, when I was a teenager. I got involved in martial arts. And it yeah. taught me right away to the value of self-control. Yeah and uh, overcoming the worst parts of your own nature. Let's go ahead and sell it, John Arena, for whatever you want to, because you are the pizza Yoda, because you are the pizza godfather. Please tell us what you would like to sell it for. Go ahead. I think the most important thing to, most important key to enjoying your life is immersion. Picking something and just throwing yourself completely into it with your heart, your mind, your body. Throwing away, your, throwing away your calendar, throwing away your watch, and just experiencing what you're doing in that moment and appreciating it. You know, I think the first thing you have to do is you have to admire, pick somebody that is a role model that you really admire, and then aspire. Look at that person and say, how do I get to be like that? And then perspire, put the work in. <laughs> you know, so those three things. You know, if you really want to be good at something, there's no sacrifice that's too great. No detail that's too small. Everything counts. And, you know, we get so many people that say, they'll do something and they'll say, well, that's not who I am. You know, I did this, I did this horrible thing, but that's not who I am. What you do is exactly who you are. There's no disconnect between what you do and who you are. Yeah. You know, so... Be mindful of what you do and how it affects other people and how it impacts your life today and tomorrow and forever. I love that. It reminds me of Maya Angelou. I love her so much. And she once okay. said, when someone shows you who they are, believe them. True. And it's just, it's so yeah. simple, but it's true. Mm -hmm. And I got to say, and I'm sure Louie has something to say too, like, thank you so much. Like, Thanks this is unbelievable. This, this is... This time is a gift, honestly. Yeah. Um, like I, 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 I can't explain it. I'm just like talking to you has me inspired on so many different levels. Yes, you, you've taken like a a product, basically pizza, had me thinking another way about it. John Arena, thank you so much. This is such a blessing, mm -hmm. so thank special, you. and so. I'm important. really grateful for this opportunity to talk to you. I really appreciate it. We're so Thank appreciative you. of having you and giving us this time. And right. it means the world to us. We're very yeah. honored.